Hello. Hi. Good. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Hoi Sang. I work for Dual Attract Technologies, and um, I'm here today because I want to share some of our experience using Jenkins from the last two years uh, with one of our projects, uh, plus some other tools that I'm sure that I'm sure most of you have heard of: uh, Vagrant, Fab Python Fabric, and Selenium. And um, so. It's more like I want to share the knowledge that we and experience that we have, and you know, I'm looking forward to hear any feedback from anyone after this chat, after this talk. Um, just a little background of our projects: we have been working on a new platform for the company's uh, flagship product from the last two years, and it went live early this year successfully. Uh, we have initially have one Scrum team, but then we scale out to six plus seven, depends on how many changes, we, how many features we want to build out. Uh, we have, we're not a small company, we have above 3,000 employees. Um, definitely we have a new system. We also have legacy system need to integrate together. And we also have multiple languages and system resource that we, our system need to talk to. So our system is not just a web uh, message broker or a database. There are quite a bit of uh, stuff that we are building, quite a bit of stuff that we have to integrate with uh, within our firm. So that's quite a bit of a challenge. Um, but before I go over uh, some of the cases that we encounter in the practice that we have, I want to talk about uh, those, those to me as what we call skill sets, right? The Jenkins is the tools, uh, there's the plugins available, but without the right mindset, you can have a lot of skill set, it will not bring you up further ahead. So, does anyone see this picture, any problems here? Right? So it's a typical project, right? You have two teams building a railroad together, one on each end, and then they, just, they, they build the railroad every day, and I look at you, you look at me, and at the end, oops, it doesn't click. So when you indicate software system, it's the same thing, right? So we build one working on one group, there's another group working on the other part, and then they don't really work out together until they, you know, until they go production. So that will be a problem. And it takes time, it's a lot, very expensive to, to fix a problem. Um, so there's a fairly example of integrations, but how about these pictures? This is uh, this is uh, some aerobics from the Chinese circuits, and this is to me is a is a good example of what integration is. Um, it doesn't happen overnight, so it takes a lot of practice, it takes a lot of precision and discipline, and you get to perfections. So this is to me the mindset need to be in, imposed in the team. All the teams that work together need to be agreed upon that they are they are they need to be uh, able to put this together. And the formula here, if you look carefully, is not an addition; it's a multiplication. So what does it mean? If you not doing any one of these parameter, if you put a zero there, you get zero. So you're not moving ahead. So the team, whoever work together, need to be agreed upon that uh, they need to practice this every day. Uh, they need to make sure that whatever they're doing is correct and they need to be disciplined whenever they make changes. So this is the mindset the team has to have. And our shops also follow Scrum. Uh, I think most of you already know what is Scrum and Agile. I'm not going to go too much about it. You have story, put in the backlog. Every spring, basically, is a two-week cycle. You pick a set of story and work on it, and you go very fast, and you basically have one day to design, about five days to do your really coding, and then you start doing QA, working with QA integrating together. So you have a very, very short window, need to make everything happen. And my point is, in Scrum is, you're basically driving really fast on a curvy road, really, really fast, right? So you need, you need to, in order to drive fast and make sure you're efficient, you need something that's reliable, something that's automated to help you manage this change process. And I'm sure most of you here, I hope, I'm not sure how many here are a, a, a VP level or a manager level, but I hope that this mindset, um, you can bring it back to your team if, if it helps you. And here's how Jenkins comes to rescue. So, so how we did it. So I'm gonna go through a, a, a fundamental case for individual small team or single package that we're working on and we'll work, work, work um, upstream to multi-package, multi-layer, how we do, how we use Jenkins, some of the tools that we have, and then we scale with multiple teams working together. So as, as a practice for a single, single package or small team, we follow something called TDD, 
test-driven development. Um, how, how many people here know what's test-driven development? Well, this is awesome, right? So, so what, and um, we also follow automated build and deploy. It means you invest your time to do your uh, automated build setup in Jenkins, do your deployment as well, set it up. And we also have reports and documentation generations um, as part of every build. And the tools we use, uh, we're not, I'm very excited to, I just saw the uh, workflow plugin before, I'm very excited and looking forward to use it. However, before we see that, we, we, uh, we actually use a library called Fabric in Python. How many Python developers here? Have you guys used uh, Fabric before? No, then you gotta check it out. Um, we also have uh, internal artifact repositories, means we actually have, our, uh, have a repo internally within our shops. So you can download a package from, uh, from Maven repository publicly. You can download uh, a Python package from public PyPy, but we actually host our internal uh, repo to, to host the packages. Um, we have a Jenkins setup. We use a build pipeline plugin, which I'm gonna try out to see if we can replace it with workflow. We also have Kubertura violation plugin. This will just help you generate the reports. We also have all made build jobs, all made deployment jobs. So TDD, a lot of you already know, so I'm gonna go through very quickly. You write a test, you run tests to see if the, you, your code will fail because you haven't implemented the feature yet. Then you implement the features and you run your test and refactor your code until you pass, right? Everyone know about this. But the key is how, how much is writing relevant test cases and explore meaningful use cases. You need to know who, where, who is using my code, what system is using my code, under what situation my code will fail, and making sure that our code is not only handling functionally that, uh, some of the cases, but there are non-functional cases that you want to anticipate as well. So the effort should be spent in exploring meaningful use cases and define meaningful use data, the test data. Um, the next thing we have is automated build. This is simple, everyone know here. Uh, you trigger by code commit or by schedule. You run your tests, making sure all the tests pass. The team will define what the pass failure rules will be. Uh, they will define, uh, in our case, all the tests has to pass. Uh, how many people know what's code coverage here? How many people don't know what's code coverage? How many people know what's code coverage? Good. So. <laughs> So I'm not gonna go further. So when we run our tests, we capture the code coverage. We also make sure our coding co co coverage over 90%, making sure that is the coding standards also, uh, it, it follow through the standard. I think in, in Java world, you have, uh, in Maven, you can, you can, you, you can use Kubertura. In our case on Python, we are doing uh, PyFlix and uh, PyLean. There are multiple tools available. Uh, so when the code, when a test pass, we package our code, we upload into our internal repository. Uh, this is all in Python. At the same time, we publish our report and you know, Jenkins job will publish a report and stand coding standards result. The next step, we will trigger a job that will automatically generate all the API docs, right? So it's all in anything that you can automate, we automate at the same time and then we'll trigger deployment jobs. We use Jenkins Build Pipeline plugin, parameterized trigger plugin, and also we use the tools that we use are, are local shops, which, which is a open source version of uh, Python PyPy. Uh, we also use Nexus as the factory for, for the Java. Uh, the deployment job is basically you pick up the build from the internal repo. Uh, this is where the Python fabric script will come in and help. And the script we, we write will pick up the build, tunnel into the server through SSH, and deploy the code, and you know, de drop off the file, deploy the build, and then reload, re restart the servers. Um, it's, it sounds magical, but it is that magical. Um, so what is Python Fabric? Uh, it's basically a command line tool that helps you to stream, it's a Python library that helps you streamline a lot of uh, Unix command, SSH command, and you can define your functions Everything is in Python functions, so you can define your environment as a Python functions. Basically, preset a bunch of uh, 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 variables to specify where's my host, my username, password, or the keys are uh, keys, and then you can deploy. You can define another function that um, how your deployment needs to be executed. You can tailor custom made uh, deployment functions just like a Unix running a set of Unix command. Instead of writing a set of Unix command, you can 
there's a there's a Python API in this library allow you to define that. It's very similar to the workflow plugin we saw before, but um, this is in Python. And you can also specify the parameters here uh, to inject into that function. So uh, I heard one of the questions, one of the um, one of our, our, our colleague here mentions, you want to check out your specific uh, script to do the build. So in our case, we write a specific uh, fabric script to do our build. But when we kick off the build job, it will check out a copy of that Python scripts because we have seven different types of server we need to do deployments. Um, uh, in our case, you need to have an internal repository. How many, how many of you have an internal repository holding artifacts? So I get, I get about 60%, which is great. Um, there, if, even if you have a small teams, you just don't know how many transitive dependencies you will need, right? If you do MVN package, everything sits in your .m2 folder. But when you have uh, multiple people working to there as a team, uh, especially using a commercial third party library, uh, anybody use JBoss? <laughs> have you ever been able to successfully download all the JBoss artifacts in one shot? It's just setting up the JBoss repository is a pain. So you don't want your, you know, if you have one person doing this, you can archive everything in your internal repo in one shot and your palm file will get smaller, right? Um, so it's important to have a critical, it's important to have your internal repository not only hosting your snapshot, your releases, but it also helps to proxy out all the external partner repo that you will need and you do it only one time. If you ever lose internet connectivity, you have all the files. So this is fundamental. We need to make sure that, in our case, we do automatic build, we have automatic deployment, we run for all the tests, have enough code coverage, we have internal repository store artifacts as well as transitive dependencies. This is for just fundamental. Now, going in reality, you have multiple packages. You're not working on one package. You could have 30, 40 different packages working together. You could have multiple layer of resources, not only just, you know, Python code or just my, my web application code, but there could be database code, there could be message brokers. Uh, the key here is to do, uh, in our practice, we do automate integration build. Means once our code is checked out, we do an integrated build, that's part of our unit test. So we have one set of unit tests just to test a code. We have another set of unit tests that actually hit the database resources, hit the underlying resources, you really run your code as if more like productions. We also have a, a standard versions, versionings and dependency management. And I'm gonna show you how this is crucial. If you're running, moving, if you move at one changes, it's many times we're not only moving one component or one build, we're moving a stack of things together, right? I, I'm sure there's a commercial software out there that does the work, but in our case, the key point is being able to manage from top to bottom uh, what the dependencies are. And the tools we use to do the automated build is Vagrant. H how many people use Vagrant here? Well, this is great. Uh, how many people do custom dependency management on your own, own system? There's a few people here. I think they know the pain point here. So how do we do automated integrated build? Uh, we are actually testing, making the course, making API call to the actual module you're using. You're not running mock anymore. You're hitting really the deep resources. Means you need to, to, to do that. Uh, you basically need a mini stack. You need a production-like environment to really drop in all the code. If I have a database, I have an Oracle, I have DB2, I have a message broker, I have a service layer, ESB, I have a web servers, you name it. Your stack looks, you know, as, the more complicated you have, the more uh, integration point you have, and you know, the more important the integration build is. So by, I'm sorry. So what Vagrant helps us in this case is, Vagrant is basically a full-fledged configurations, a command line that allow you to wrap around uh, a set of VMware uh, VM emulator or providers in a smaller scales. And you can define a set of, a, a mini stack and put this stack into a subnet, right? However your network in production looks like, you can even define farm or server, but I don't know how, many, how, much, uh, how much VM you can host in the box, but, um, Vagrant allow us to be able to spin up a stack, put them into a different network segment according to what your production like. At the same time, you, it allow you to hook up 
uh, a set of server provisioning tools, puppet shifts, Docker's, I think uh, Amazon's, uh, those are emulated, but allow you to hook up Chef and Puppet, even Shell Command to help you provisioning systems or, or, or custom made a specific image. And once you have the image set up, you can distribute the image into multiple different environments. And so whenever you need to do the integration build, you can easily define a stack in the Raven file, spin up a stack, and then drop in all the code into the shared folder in each VM, or going back to the basic fundamental case we just looked at before, reuse your Python fabric script to do the deployment into this mini stack. Right? Once the stack is ready, you can push a button and run your test going underneath with the, with the downstream resources. And your test can write it just like a regular unit test, but really hitting the resources, right? It's more production-like. Um, Vagrant, I, I guess most of the people you, you know here how to do Vagrant up. You can do Vagrant SSH tunnel into the box to run your test and Vagrant destroy. And before I go to the next topic, I just want to give you one example how valuable this integration test is. So we have one root database package that uh, we basically force the DBA to write the code and then we, write, we wrap around uh, their code with our Python script to release their code as a Python package. So when he make the changes before Christmas Eve, you know, rush and check in the code, and check in the, he check in his code, we do a database release build, the database got built, but when you check out a copy of the database code and try to do the integrated build with our code, the Jenkins build pipeline is, is like a Christmas tree changing light color from green to everything turned to red, right? But the, my point here is uh, without him, without us setting up the integrating build jobs to test against verify multiple application packages, we won't be able to catch this. So there's very important to do an integrated build. Uh, the other thing is standard versioning dependency management. I, I, how many people here works with works in a firm where you have software development teams do the code, but then there are uh, network infrastructure team complete manage their networks, and then there are database team working with complete dealing with their database schemas, like they're separated, right? So these happen usually when you when a, when a company grow a little bigger from a small firm to a mid-sized firm, they spread out the responsibility. Every team focus on one main functions, right? Now they they work differently. They don't necessarily on on, on, on track with what the development team's doing. So the key is uh, we need to start with having a, some basic standard versioning format first, right? I, I'm sure every team has their own, but having one standard format that is used across divisions will help you to communicate between teams. Um, we also, another thing that will, is, is quite a challenge, not technically, but the culturally difference is you want to have one standard dependency management tools. Um, it's not it, it's always technically doable, but it's because what I mentioned before now, they have a separate of, they spread out the responsibility between teams, then not every team's on board using the same tool. Some prefer using uh, a commercial tool, some is preferring using open source. But the key is have one standard way to manage the dependencies. Do as much as you can from top to bottom I mentioned before wrapping around the DBA's uh, scripts, the database scripts to, and then uh, basically ask them, give them, a, give them an SVN space, have them check in the code here, and then I just put two Python scripts there whenever they make changes. We just basically check out the whole workspace, run our Python script and release their code as a Python, dependency, Python package. So we can define dependency in that code if it works, right, if the test works. Another example is if you have network devices no balances, work very closely to your applications, right? You could also have the low balancer configuration being checked out, put them into resource control and take the same strategy where you can maybe put a, if you're doing Java, you can do an MVM package, or, right? You can check out their code, wrap around it, and then release it as whatever packages, whatever dependency management tool you guys are using. And when you deploy your, their, their code into your mini stack to verify, to run the integration test, if it passes, you can now depend, define dependency on that network configurations. So at the end of the day, when you move your code to productions, you, do not, you don't have to worry about, hey, if I move one piece, will this work, right? If I move this piece, I only integrate to the bottom. I'm not sure if it will work, but with the up, upstream package. But if you're able to do it from the top to bottom, the, 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 the further you do it, the more confident your, 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 your automated build will be, and the more confident you will be when you release your code into productions. 
But Jenkins can only run this job efficiently and uh, correctly when you define them uh, properly. I'm going, am I, am I going a little too fast? <laughs> no. Um, so, so the next step is now you have, uh, we have multiple teams. So initially we have one giant Jenkins box with a lot of disk space, with a lot of RAM. It doesn't scale because you are now having, even you have a lot of CPUs, um, because the way how we do our integrated build, we do a lot of uh, heavy network I.O. because you're launching a bunch of VM at the same time. You basically need a VM infrastructure to support it. That's very expensive. And in our case, we start distributing into Jenkins build, into Jenkins slaves. Uh, what we did is we, we give each team their own dedicated slave so then they can build all day long whatever they want to build. We also give each team a server to, um, to run the test. So if they, once they finish building it, they can drop the code into their, their test environment just to do any manual test or run any test they want. But at the same time, we want to have a Jenkins master to continue to maintain all the build pipeline so we know when one build triggers the other, the other type of jobs. Uh, but you have, we have many, many different slaves. And the strategy we use is um, we have dedicated slaves for the more important jobs, uh, for example, for the master branch, for hot fixes. Uh, those are the type of jobs that we will give a better, better system resources. Uh, for example, we'll, we'll maybe we'll be able to put a SSD inside the servers, so the build job run a lot faster. You do need to run an integrated build. Is I think we test it uh, is at least thirty percent faster, right? And you could have a pool of slave just for the less important build jobs that maybe a team or feature branch or maybe a merge build with the master they use a share pool. Um, and last. I think I ran a little too fast, but <laughs> last, um, with our integration test finished, now the next thing is we will, we sh we, the code is deployed into environment. I think a lot of users also use Selenium. Um, we, we actually have the Jenkins master also running the Gen Selenium hub. So the, we also, we have a Selenium grid where they are basically just window VMs or dedicated window boxes. When they boot up, they automatically register back to the Jenkins um, Selenium hub to basically register, make sure they are available to do the test. And when we, we use a robot framework as a library for us to write the test cases, how many of you heard of robot framework? And how many actually, have, have you guys used it? Right, so how many of you heard of Cucumber? There's a lot more, <laughs> okay. So, so, uh, Robot framework is very similar to Cucumber. It's basically a text data, a simple text data format allow you to create your test cases and allow you to translate these test cases into Selenium API call. And, and so within the same Jenkins master, we have a Selenium hub running. Um, through the robot framework, the test cases get distributed to the Selenium grid. We run the test, open the, you know, the Selenium node, open the browser, run the test, take a screenshot, we fail. But at the end, it will gather all the report back to the, the Jenkins job itself. So when I finish running my test, I can see if what test is passed, what test fail, and if I click on the fail cases, uh, there will be screenshot available to tell me why it failed. So there's no finger pointing. We can see exactly what's broken. Um, I think I'm pretty much done with, my, with whatever I prepare. <laughs> I think maybe I'll rush through a little bit quick. Um, do, do you guys, yeah, sure. Right. What's your belief on having multiple masters? We don't have multiple master. We only have one master, but we have, uh, I don't even know how many slaves we have now. But the, the point is, um, it depends your, how, how frequently your team is doing the build and in our case, we dedicate slaves for the teams that where, you know, first thing first is you need to find out where, where the bottleneck is, right? So if there are one particular team that do build, you know, heavily on a daily basis and they need a dedicated system resources, so basically we set up more slaves for that team and they can just use it. Or, 
or we can do a little more freeform style. You can go um, get yourself a very beefy desktop tower, put it underneath your desk, hook it up to Jenkins Master. You can run all the build job all day long. We use uh, Python Fabric since we have some time left. Maybe we can go through a few examples here. Uh, maybe I'll go into the website and show some of the examples here. Uh, I don't think I'm on the internet. Um, give me a second. Oops. Yeah. We have one script to do the deploy jobs for multiple environment, right? So the only difference is your environment definitions. So let me, let me see if I... Um, In the beginning of the presentation, you yeah. mentioned that you were using a, a parameterized uh, builds. Correct. So how do you actually get the values uh, uh, depending on uh, one, one parameter, uh, depending on the other parameter? So in each Jenkins job, you can have a build number. Right, those are standard, the Jenkins job itself has a standard set of variable you can use. So when you trigger, you can just pass along those numbers. So this is bill 100, you just pass along bill 100. So next job could pick up that bill number and just run the test and deploy the, the bill 100 uh, package. Um, so I think I want to show you a little more better example. The best. The best thing. The, the best thing is you can if you can define all the all the all the all the dependencies. So you have have a definition of dependencies first, right? I can have package level dependencies. I can have container configuration dependencies. Configuration management is always um, arguable subject. Uh, but if you can, if anything that's a file, binary or even a text form, you can always wrap it around and then give it the version number and shuffle into repo. And once you have a version number in the repo, I can define dependency on that package. So going back to the database uh, example, we have, we have a few hundred tables, right? To run through the SQL script to build a database takes hours, right, to build a database, right, from SQL script. I'm sure it's, it's clean, but it takes forever. So what we did with database build is we, when we build a database package, when only we check out the code, we actually launch um, a Vagrant VM, going in, drop the code into the database, build a database schema, then we do a database backup. And then we wrap around the database backup as a Python package. It's pretty big, it's like from, from 100 meg growing now, it's like 700 meg, right? That's probably the biggest package ever we have. But for me to run integration tests, I can just check out a copy of that package, run through the backup is a lot faster than running through the SQL script from build from the beginning to the end. So what, what I'm trying to say is you can, as long as there's a file, you can, there's always same, you can use the same trick to define dependency on that package. But, you know, again, this is, Anything that is, is technically doable, but is cultural changes that you that will be a challenge between between teams. Not, for example, the network team may not like it. They want to use a commercial tool to do the backup or do their configuration. They don't want to check their config into source control. You know, they don't like SVN. They don't like Git. Then that will be a challenge. So, getting them on board with this process, showing them there's a value proposition for them, will be a key. So. Um, so let me see if I can show you a simple fabric file. Um, so this probably will be better. Can you see? So in this case, I just have a Python fabric API. I define all the holes, all the servers I have. And I have a function called basically running a Unix command called uptime. So when I run my fab command, which is a fabric command, I basically just run uptime because my environment variable is set with these three holes it will tunnel into these three servers through SSH and execute a unique command for you. So same thing for code deployment, if I wrap around this environment variable inside a function I call dev test or, or, or QA, 
right? I can have 2,000 servers here, or you, you, as long as you can define the set of holes here, you can you reuse the same routine here to do your code deployment. Uh, so this, this is, may not be a good example, uh, but deploying with Fabric. Um, so this is another example. You have an actual user that tunnel to the servers. These are the server server host name you have. Uh, this is a function to pack package the Python code, but the deploy routine is mentioned here, right? You can have MVN deploys always too magical, right? It high a lot of complexities when you automate it. Um, in, in Maven world, in Java world, uh, in Python world, uh, uh, Python because the language is a little more simpler. In our case. When you do some deployment, there's always one, one or two things you have to hack it, right? You have to run a Unix command. So in our case, we better off just do everything in a Unix environment. But uh, the five and fabric script work perfectly here. We can define all our commands, all our Unix command here uh, within one single script, and it's smart enough to you can specify a set of server, and then it will repeatedly go into this set of server or in parallel to execute this command for you. Yes. Right. Are you writing scripts or in many cases there's plugins that will help you manage and communicate to a, a controlling or master node that you deploy to the master node? We, we are not using Jenkins to do production deployment yet um, because we are we are moving to that direction. Uh, we are a public trading company, so everything needs to go in production, needs to have a separate team to do the changes. They have their tools, but for all the other pre prod environment, we are using Fabric to do the changes. But you can define this, again, it depend, doesn't matter which environment, you can define all the routine, all the rule, using these scripts and however you want to freeform define the jobs in, in Jenkins and do it for you. Yeah. Well, I, I guess yeah. what I'm asking you, Mr. Yeah. Dill, is are you trying to, when you deploy out to a cluster environment, yeah. the scripting, are you scripting out all that stuff or are you taking advantage in some cases where some of these platforms may have like a, a controlling master node that you deploy to it and so, it so, deploys to the cluster so, so uh, we have one case like that. So we use uh, one of the um, one of the software product we use is called Mule, Mule ESB, yeah. right? So yeah. right. So we don't do we don't do we don't tunnel to the box and drop into the app folder, right? Okay. We don't do that. We use the MMC API. It comes with the RESTful API, where we again we just write a few Python scripts. Say, hey, we have a new Maven build. We're using Nexus. Nexus have an, also have a set of RESTful API you can call. Give me the latest snapshots. It will give you, give you the it will give you the group, artifact, and versions, classifier, right? So you extract that in the Python script. I can extract this information with just one line, two line, and then the third line is calling the uh, the MMC API. And MMC a little painful. You got to deploy first, and then deploy deploy the new changes. So. But a lot of the cases that you have different container, they all work differently. And sometimes Jenkins blocking does so much up to so far, but then there are always a piece that you always have to hack. But you know, instead of doing that, I can cleanly define some of these complete end-to-end -end routine in a 20-line Python script, which is elegant and clean. And this script can be rerun and reused in another environment, even without, not, not necessarily just within a Jenkins box. Yes. Yes. It's it's discipline. <laughs> so we we don't have a model where uh, we have a dictatorship, someone overseeing the box, right? So we're working on a scrum. Your team have to make the decisions, right? So you have to play nice, right? I'm not, I can't ship my job to the box that always have an SSD running or, you know, 64 gig RAM, just move my build there. It's not gonna work. So, and you do it once, you may get through a second time, it may work, but, you know, during crunch time, people catch you. <laughs> it's not a good thing, so. How do you manage plugins across the, different, different teams on different plugins? Different teams on different plugins? I don't understand that question, I'm sorry. Jenkins allows you to install multiple plugins? Yeah. Um, we, we haven't encountered that situation yet. Um, we use 
certain set of pipe, uh, Jenkins plugin. I think one of the one of our colleagues here mentioned they had problem upgrading Jenkins plugin with different versions. We got burned as well, and because it, it, it almost took us one day to recover the whole whole build infrastructures. Because of that, when we do any upgrade, we will try to just like what our code is doing, test it in a separate environment, making sure they work first. And in in some cases, uh, we try to even avoid using it because of it's not a good thing, but we should explore. But in our case, if I can finish my 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 changes in 20 line Python code, I would rather go this way. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand your questions. What was the reason not to have multiple masters, masters per team? We, we don't have that. Maybe we, this is a case we should explore. Uh, but our, in our case, the master doesn't really build anything. The master is just managing all the job pipeline for us. Right? You can go and define job and define a pipeline and running the Selenium grid. In our case, it's more for the Jenkins slaves that is doing the job for the teams. So if you are, your team need more heavy, your team doing a bunch of mule build, you got to do a, you know, running mule. Maven test is pretty expensive for mule, so we'll dedicate more hardware for that team. Yeah, so I think there's a certain level you have to trust each team, trust each other. But if you don't have that level of trust, then I think there are some other issues need to be addressed there first. Because this is a shared environment, at the end of the day, you know, we, we're helping each other out. We don't want to just occupying a dedicated set of resources for one particular group. So, yeah. Yes. Quick, I know these are hard yeah. to answer. Same question. Yes. Have you used both Artifactory and Nexus? I have not used Artifactory yet. Okay. But I think I heard uh, some of our engineers actually evaluate the product and they preferred using Artifactory. We use Nexus because it's the first thing out there is much better than all the other freebies. Uh, easy for us to configure. So, okay. Uh, thank you for being here. But before it ends, I'm gonna take a, take a selfie so my boss trusts that I'm here. <laughs> okay. And uh, say hi for me. Thank you, everyone.